Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third webinar in our four-part foodborne pathogen webinar series, Cyclosporia chiotinensis, Implications in Production and Processing of Fresh Produce. My name is Laura Wildey, and I'm the Senior Program Analyst in Food Safety for the National Environmental Health Association. It is my pleasure to facilitate today's webinar. I am joined by my colleagues, Audrey Keenan, Project Coordinator, and Taryn Laird, Public Health Communications Specialist. Please note this webinar is being recorded. If you are not okay with this being recorded, you may disconnect at this time. We are now in our third week of National Food Safety Education Month. NEHA is dedicated to supporting our food safety workforce, and we continue to offer several free events and webinars throughout September. Take a look at our website for more information. Also newly announced is a food safety industry roundtable rising above the challenges of COVID-19, which will be held Tuesday, September 29th. To register, see NEHA's Food Safety Education Month webpage. Excuse me. Additionally, membership does have its benefits. We create and deliver value every day for you. Connect with your peers, network, and get access to valuable resources and educational materials. If you're not already a member of NEHA, check out our website at neha.org to learn more. A bit of housekeeping before we dive into Cyclospora. All attendees are in listen-only mode. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. We intend to have time for questions at the end of the presentations, so please submit any questions you may have into the Q&A box and we will do our best to answer as many questions as time permits. I am pleased to introduce you to our speaker today, Dr. Inez Ortega. Dr. Ortega is an associate professor at the Center for Food Safety, University of Georgia. She received her undergraduate degree at the Universidad Peruano Cayetano Herrera Doctorate in Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Arizona and MPH in International Health from Johns Hopkins University. Her research is focused on waterborne pathogens. She is currently studying the dynamics of disease transmission that take place in the production and processing of food products. Dr. Ortega's research evaluates detection assays used in food production that are sensitive and specific for pathogenic parasites in both biological and environmental samples in domestic and international settings. She has also expanded her efforts to the development and testing of disinfectants for use on, in fresh produce and to the study of risk factors associated with parasitic foodborne transmission. Dr. Ortega has been a science advisor for nine years for FDA SRL as part of the FAO WHO expert team that address prioritization of foodborne parasites for risk management, has authored many peer-reviewed manuscripts and book chapters, and is editor of three books on foodborne parasites. She is a member of the editorial board of the Journal for Food Protection, Food and Waterborne Parasitology Journal, and the Agro-Food Safety Frontiers in Sustainable Food Systems Journal. Review editor for Frontiers in Microbiology, Infectious Diseases, and member of the Journal for Food Protection Management Committee. Welcome, Dr. Ortega. The floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, where are you? I lost you. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Laura and Terry. Um, it is my pleasure to wear my share. Okay, am I looking, uh, is it good? It's looking good? Or you're looking at the... We're looking at presenter mode. If you could just um, switch. Okay. Oh. It should be under display settings and then switch presenter. Take your time. There I think we we're all getting there used to this. <laughs> <laughs> you will think like, I know this very well. I do this every day and I still get lost. How about now? Yes, that looks great. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Again, thank you very much, Laura and Terry, for the invitation. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, so uh, this is a topic, I guess, a very important topic this year because we've had a cyclospora outbreak since uh, about uh, 20 years, uh, 
and counting. And uh, it seems that we still have a lot of stuff to do to control this, uh, this uh, parasite. So um, and today we're gonna be talking about uh, several issues and I hope I can um, uh, explain to you what are the challenges and the importance of working with this pathogen that uh, normally uh, we don't take uh, parasites, uh, parasite infections or parasite illness here in the U.S. is such a big issue in food safety, but again, cyclospora is definitely one of them. And the name Cayetanensis, as you can see, and Laura did a very good job mentioning it. As you can also tell, I'm, uh, I speak Spanish, and that's why I can say the word Cayetano very well. And, uh, and uh, the name Cayetanensis comes from the university where, where more, most of the work, the initial work was done, Cayetano Heredia University. And uh, as you will see, the story about this parasite, uh, it's, it's very long. We, we called it emerging, an emerging par parasite, but again, it's uh, basically that we discovered it, but that doesn't mean that the parasite was not present before. We just knew that there was a lot of uh, diarrhea that happened in travelers, but we didn't know the etiological agent of these uh, illnesses. So um, we're going to be talking a little about all of these topics uh, today. And the very first one is about uh, cyclospora. Um, again, uh, trying to um, uh, cover all the bases, making sure that we all know what cyclospora is. It's a coccidian parasite that can ha cause all of these uh, symptoms in individuals. But again, it doesn't necessarily have to be symptomatic. It can be asymptomatic. And as you will see uh, in, in, this com in this talk, uh, this can be present, especially in endemic locations. Two very important elements on this parasite is that there's no enrichment meaning. So what does this mean? It means that in case of uh, the bacteria, if the bacteria, bacterial contaminant, let's say E. coli or salmonella or listeria, we have the opportunity to grow them in enrichment media, selective media, different options. And in the case of uh, parasites as well as viruses, uh, they are they require a host in order to be able to multiply. And in some instances, they are they require a very specific host. In this case. Cyclospora seems to be exclusively anthropogenic and seems to be exclusively uh, for humans. So again, <clears throat> we don't have enrichment media and it requires a vertebrate host to multiply. The other interesting thing about this parasite is that when cyclospora is excreted in the feces, it looks like this. It's very, it's a circular mass that uh, really doesn't have any shape. We call it a morula. But again, with the, in the right conditions of temperature, relative humidity, et cetera, this uh, small oil cyst, which measures about 10 microns C in diameter, will differentiate and form this structure. If we look at them in my electron microscopy, you can see here, this is basically a mass with multiple organelles, again, cytoplasm, et cetera. But again, uh, after those uh, seven to 15 days, you will see that this one, turns into two sporocysts, and this is the cross-section of one of them. You can see here the nuclei. You can see all of these uh, ultrastructures that are very, very typical of a coccidian parasite. So we've heard about cyclospora pretty much since the year we described it. Uh, we officially described it in 1995, and you can see here that there were cases, many cases, uh, in the U.S. This is a table basically in the U.S. some of those out outbreaks and as you can see most of these products were berries. So we have raspberries, we have blackberries and um, actually the very first outbreak in 1995 was implicated, uh, was suspected to be caused by strawberries that were contaminated with cyclospora but then later it was determined that it was probably uh, raspberries but at that time we knew very little about this parasite. What we did know was the epidemiology of this parasite in developing countries because cyclospora was being studied at that time uh, by people, uh, large groups in Peru and in Nepal. So we knew what was going on with cyclospora in endemic locations in the human population. But again, 
when it came to ways of transmission, what elements, what uh, foods were implicated in this transmission, we knew very little. So as you can see, uh, a lot of these, we had few salad outbreaks, but most of them were associated to, uh, to berries. It wasn't until 2013 where we re really started seeing a lot of cases. And the first one in 2013, had, we had uh, several cases, but um, what, what's interesting about this is even at that point, we had two very well defined uh, peaks. The very first one was um, in Iowa and Nebraska, and the other one was in Texas. The one in Iowa and Nebraska was associated with uh, uh, salad mix produced by um, Taylor Farms of Mexico. And the one uh, in Texas, this one, uh, was uh, uh, caused or associated with uh, cilantro that was produced in Puebla in Mexico. Since then, we have seen, again, cases, 304 cases in, from Puebla, and all of these are from non-travelers, which is kind of interesting because we have always seen cyclospora throughout the year, more or less depending on whether um, people travel to endemic locations where cyclospora was actually, um, it was the season of cyclospora, so people acquired the infection and came back to the US with, uh, with diarrhea and all of these symptoms. But again, all of these cases of non-travelers, uh, uh, people in the US acquired the infection. And again, you can see it's 300, 500, 300, 2017, one, uh, 2017. So again, uh, there was a lot of interest uh, because of this number of cases. In 2018, we had another large, uh, number of cases, but uh, uh, 2299 cases, 32, 33 states. So it's a very significant number. But what is interesting about this graph is that if you look here in the, in the blue one, is um, an outbreak that was associated with the vegetable trays that had cauliflower, broccoli, uh, carrots, and uh, um, dill dip. Uh, the yellow ones are was from an outbreak that was associated to a fast food chain. And uh, again, these were salads that were sold and uh, this was uh, later identified or the source was considered to be um, the, salad, the salad products that were produced um, by Fresh Express. So, it's, but again, what's important in Katie's table as well is these gray bars. These gray bars are the cases of cyclospora, but they were never, never really associated to any particular food commodity. So that's telling us that we have a, a lot of work to do. Whether these products are domestic or imported, that's a, that's a, a big question mark. As a result of this uh, large outbreak that, uh, again, uh, you might imagine how detrimental it was for that for the people that were that acquired the infection, as well as for the the fast food chain and the producers of the bear of the of the vegetables uh, that commercialize these vegetables, and as I mentioned to you, also Fresh Express was implicated in this outbreak. So this was this happened in May to August 2018. Immediately in November on November 2018, Fresh Express brought a panel of experts on cyclospora to work on what are the problems okay. um, research has. So this was divided in several groups. Uh, of course, uh, root cause analysis, which is uh, one of the critical points on how is it that uh, the uh, salad products were contaminated from not only uh, environmental sources, but also from uh, field workers, equipment that they are using, whether it's in the air or how is it that it's uh, being spread. And not only that, but what if uh, that's something that uh, um, it's very minimal and we cannot really detect it? How can we avoid uh, the, these uh, uh, outbreaks? So one of the problems that we have, one of the challenges that we have with this parasite is that it's highly resistant to disinfect. So um, 
we really cannot, uh, well, we're still looking on that. We're working on that. And there's a lot of works, uh, groups that are working on that, trying to find a way to kill this parasite. But again, you know, if we don't have that, what else can we do? Whether we can protect the water sources, uh, look at the equipment, what care we should have uh, uh, the one to two weeks prior to harvest before this parasite becomes infectious. And lastly, of course, looking at the needs uh, for research, having genotyping tool, which is something that we have a lot for um, bacteria, is we can tell whether what uh, uh, particular isolate uh, uh, is uh, affecting the individual, and then you can trace it to the uh, food commodity that is causing this outbreak. Well, we don't have that yet for cyclospora, although there's a lot of work being done that. Um, in this particular area. And of course, method validation. As you will see uh, throughout my presentation, there's different groups. Everybody does different methods for testing. FDA has a start, has one method that is using at this moment for uh, anything that is regulatory. And, and actually, uh, the following year in 2019, uh, FDA brought back again a group of scientists uh, people that were working not only from um, the federal agencies, uh, but also from academia and industry to address these uh, research and data gaps that we are still uh, working on. So what happened in, I already talked to you about 2017, we had very, very many cases, uh, several with no international travel, et cetera. And in 2018, we had this case, okay? And uh, as I mentioned to you, this one is the Fresh Express outbreak. 2019, we had more cases now. It was uh, 2,400 cases and the uh, association at least for of, those, of these 2,400 of uh, 241 cases was associated with fresh basil that was produced in uh, Morelos in Mexico. Again, there's more, uh, as you know, with a Produce Safety Alliance, there's a lot of things uh, in FISMA, there's a lot of uh, effort trying to uh, work on the production as well as the good agricultural practices, all kinds of things trying to prevent uh, exactly the, what is going on here. But 2020, uh, again, we have 1,100 cases, 34 states. And this time it was associated with uh, uh, iceberg lettuce, cabbage, and or carrots. Uh, those are bagged uh, uh, vegetables. And uh, it uh, implicated, again, 690 cases were in, uh, part of this outbreak out of 1,100 cases. So there's about uh, 400 cases that are still um, not associated with a particular product. And not only that, but also then in Canada, 37 cases were reported and again, associated to, to this uh, salad mix. What is interesting about cyclospora is uh, the seasonality. Uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, we have been working, uh, a lot of the basic pre initial work was done in endemic locations. And the first one was Nepal, uh, we were doing in Peru. And Guatemala, because it was implicated in the outbreaks, in the early outbreaks of uh, cyclospora with berries in the US, there was uh, some work done over there as well. What is interesting is that um, if you look in this table, uh, the cases of uh, cyclospora in Guatemala is usually during the, May, the months of May to August. And this repeats every single year. And as you can see here, the, few, the number of cases in the rest of the year are fewer, much, much lower, okay, the detection rates. If you look at the age, uh, you can see that the largest number of cases are of children less than nine years old. And then you have very few cases uh, from years ages 10 to 60. And then you, you, hear, you see the elderly population also getting symptomatic. And also that what's interesting about this table is that uh, yes, you can see in children, 
that they have symptomatic presentation of the illness. But again, there's a lot of cases in which uh, the children are asymptomatic. Okay. So again, there, these are two important characteristics. The first one is the seasonality. And the second one is that uh, even individuals with cyclospora don't have necessarily to present a clinical, uh, have a clinical presentation. This seasonality is very uh, uh, peculiar, in, in especially with this, uh, I mean, with, in the case of cyclospora. Uh, in Nepal, and you can see here 1993, and this repeats, this does, it doesn't mean that it has stopped, it repeats. In 1993, cyclospora didn't have a name. It was not uh, described. So it was called CLB, which is called cyanobacterium-like bodies or coccidian-like body. It had different names. But um, if you look in here, the, num the cases of uh, um, cyclospora in, um, in Nepal, in this case, Kathmandu, and what's interesting about Nepal is that uh, the people that acquired the infection were travelers, people that were going to uh, hike the Himalayas and uh, um, go to Mount Everest. Those are the people that actually got sick. And they, of course, were symptomatic. They were tourists. Uh, and, uh, and again, in the local population, you can see that with uh, children. But what's interesting here is you can see that, uh, that the cases were always identified during the months of um, May, June, July, all the way down to August. And some years, the peak might be narrower, other times it might be wider, okay? This is analogy, again, remember, this is during June to, uh, let's say, May to August. In the case of uh, Guatemala, it was during the months of May to August. In the case of uh, Mexico, this is a study that was done for many years. And you can see here the seasonality of cyclospora. And again, this happens during the months of May to August. Now, that doesn't mean that it happens, that seasonality is the same for every single country. In the case of Peru, in the case of Haiti, we can see that cyclospora, the, the seasonality is high during the months of January to May or April. It's very different. It's not the same as the other ones. But this can help us also determine when is it that uh, we will find the cases in the population as well as in the environment if we need to do any, any studies. Because of these outbreaks that are occurring in the US that happened to coincide with what was going on in Mexico, uh, FDA uh, released an import alert to, det to detain um, fresh cilantro from the state of Puebla. But again, as I mentioned before, um, last year it was uh, uh, basil also from, from Mexico, but in the same area of Puebla, which is, uh, which is also very interesting. Uh, so again, all of these import alerts are just, uh, 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 it's one of the many um, um, interventions that are done to prevent the, present, uh, uh, the outbreaks of cyclospora in the US. So what is go really going on with this parasite? Again, the first cases were raspberries and, and blue blackberries. And what's interesting, most of the cases were actually associated with raspberries and not as many as the blackberries. And when I go and talk to the, to the people in these endemic locations and people that are actually dealing with uh, these uh, farmers that are dealing with these outbreaks, they always ask me, why is it that uh, there are more cases of raspberries or there were more cases of raspberries rather than blackberries, considering that the farms were not one next to the other one? The workers are about the same, the water is the same, everything is the same. Why is it that this product is more uh, prone to have this, par this parasite compared to the other one? And that may be, to the, that may be related to the morphology, the, the topology of, this, uh, of the berries. They are, of course, they have uh, vegetable fibers, which is not, that's why they don't look shiny, whereas the blackberries, they look very shiny and they don't have that kind of, of surface, which may give us some indication that uh, if um, the sun has some kind of uh, 
antimicrobial properties that UV might be able to reach the oocyst easily in this product rather than in this product. So water has been one of the biggest elements that uh, could be responsible for, for distribution, the spreading of the oocysts. Soil, that's another possibility, vegetables and reservoirs. With reservoirs, we really are not, um, uh, again, there's several groups that are working on this. We have done our, our work on that. And uh, there is Cyclospora in other, para, in other animals, okay? So that Cyclospora is not one species, there's several species and each one has their own reservoir. So again, it might be that uh, uh, there is a reservoir that we don't know yet that is present and is carrying Cyclospora. But again, uh, in our work and others uh, looking at uh, different animals that are present in different uh, environments, we have not found uh, the parasite. So there's some work that uh, was done with dogs in, in Brazil and well, somebody said, well, this, this dog has Cyclospora cayetanensis and then another group did a study again and they said, no, there's no, Cyclos Cyclospora cannot be multiplied in, cannot infect dogs. So there's a lot of questions about the same thing with chickens but, uh, and ducks, but again, we have to think, to remember that these parasites are coprophagic. So there's a possibility that if there were feces, uh, especially if it's of a child or a baby, uh, those feces would more likely be ingested by, by uh, these animals. Uh, there's also been several reports, some very old and some newer, about the presence of uh, cyclospora in foods. So here you can see lettuce, water, spinach, herbs, rockets, and the methods are very different. Everybody has a different method, but what I want you to look from this table is the percentages. So we had 1.8, 1.6, Costa Rica had eight, Cambodia, Vietnam, Egypt had 21% of their vegetables were contaminated. Italy had 12.2% of their vegetables contaminated. And again, as I mentioned to you, uh, water is also a big uh, um, uh, source where the parasite could be um, uh, present or it could be just a way to, in which uh, the parasite gets uh, disseminated into the agricultural field. So there's been some work done in river water, sewage, of course, it's present in there. Uh, wells, uh, rivers, drinking water, wastewater, etc. So we know that cyclospora can be found in water. We know that cyclospora can be found in different types of vegetables. What is interesting about this study, and again, this this study was used uh, was done. It's a molecular uh, testing, uh, looking at uh, vegetables, water, treated wastewater, soil. And what was uh, what I found interesting is if you look at the percentage uh, of the, uh, I guess, number of samples, it's uh, it's very high. It's very high in in basically all of all of the all of the pros that were tested. But again, uh, one of the challenges that we have when we work with parasites is, uh, and you all know that if we do a molecular testing, we're testing for the presence of DNA. Uh, and uh, depending on the test, it can be more specific or less specific, can be more sensitive or, or, or less or more sensitive. So again, this study in Italy and, uh, that is located here had a very high numbers of uh, or percentages of, uh, of uh, cyclospora in their environment. This outbreaks in the US, uh, again, um, brought other questions. The first one is, well, where it's, could be that a product is being imported and coming to the US already contaminated. But this paper in 2013 um, basically changed that, uh, uh, that situation. And again, um, if you look at this, in 2013, we had the outbreaks of uh, the salad greens from Taylor Farms in Mexico and the cilantro from Puebla in Mexico. But in this case, uh, the Canadians did a study 
in the using ready to eat packaged leafy greens that uh, of which uh, a large number of these vegetables were coming from the US. So 507 were uh, bags from the US, 23 from Canada, and, uh, and there were very few in Mexico. But what was interesting is that uh, even with that, they found the presence of cyclospora cryptosporidium in Jardia. Cryptosporidium is another coccidia in Jardia is a, it's a cilia. But again, it gives us a 1.7%. And if you remember when I showed you the data on Peru, and the cases were about 1.6, 1.8. So it's interesting that um, at least in the package ready to eat uh, salads uh, produced in the US was that, that high in 2013. Since then, there was a lot of effort trying to understand um, more about the molecular biology than the genetics of these parasites. So you can see there, and more in that, more than that is trying to see if we can do any fingerprinting, any tool that could be used for traceback studies, which is the critical part of that. And as you can see, again, there's lots of uh, um, lots of work done, um, and they are coming more and more. But uh, uh, those tools are fantastic as long as uh, we are using uh, fecal samples. But when we go into the environment. I, I told you that uh, we really cannot um, enrich a um, sample. So we have a sample that has very, very low number of contaminants, very low number of oocysts. It becomes a problem trying to eliminate these, uh, 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 to, to detect these parasites and more than that, trying to do the, the fingerprinting on them. So anyways, it, uh, this parasite could come from different places. The very first one is, of course, pre-harvest. We're talking about the potential contamination of foods, and uh, it can be of different levels. It can be just uh, rivers, or it can be ponds, um, water that has been collected from the aquifers, or uh, seepage irrigation. Uh, soil, perhaps, harvesting tools. Field workers are very important because somehow that those oocysts have to get in the, in the water or in the crops. And as I mentioned earlier, um, the cyclospora seems to be anthropogenic. So if there is no reservoir, the contamination is happening plain and simple with human feces. So again, the field workers, hands, shoes, clothes, etc. And when we go into the post-harvest uh, setting, of course, it's the water, depending on which water is being used. Here in the US, most of the processing facilities either use municipal water or they use well water. Um, but again, the food processor, the personal hygiene, hands and clothes. There is another way, another thing. We have been doing a lot of work overseas and uh, the, um, one of my students did this study in Peru and was looking at um, biofilms and that are formed in the, in water sources. Uh, it can be in the edges of the, if it's a river, it can be rocks and can, if it's uh, um, oxidation lagoons, it can be just the walls of these uh, lagoons. Then there, we also had, uh, and what's interesting about this, that the cases, uh, most of the cases of cyclospora were found during the months of January, February, which coincide with the cases of uh, cyclospora in the human population. In the case, we also did another study in Mexico and uh, we looked, uh, te we tested water samples and biofilms. And again, we were able to detect cyclospora during the months of March to July. For obvious reasons, if there is uh, this is a human, a parasite of humans, we found that uh, there were more cases in downstream of a town than upstream. And again, we looked for uh, the other two parasites, Jardin cryptosporidium. So again, this can, what's different about this, the Jardin cryptosporidium, depending on the assemblage, they can be zoonotic or they can be oh, very specific for uh, uh, other animals. So starting this year, we are doing testing right now in the US. 
and uh, there's other groups that are also testing um, uh, water in irrigation water or surface waters to determine what's going on in the U.S. if we truly are endemic or or just is what is going on. Um, I'm always uh, very cautious about calling something at some place endemic because again, we don't have that evidence yet. Uh, there's another study that um, uh, Lucy Robertson did uh, uh, about three years ago. And what's interesting about this is what's going on with uh, parasites when they are in, in the vegetable? How long can they survive in there? Can we detect them? So uh, uh, although she didn't use uh, Cytospora, she tested Giardia and Cryptosporium oocyst. And for Giardia, which you can grow uh, basically, and you can use animal models as well. Uh, we can tell that the parasite can, can do well, especially if they are in the refrigerator, of course, they will last longer. And if they are kept at the room temperature, well, you cannot be detecting uh, after eight days uh, post storage. In the case of Cryptosporidium, it happens pretty much the same. If it stays, in the refrigerator, of course, it will last longer. And if it's kept uh, in in the bench top on a, or in a cupboard, it will not last too long. Uh, what's interesting about this is that uh, these parasites are uh, again resistant, environmental resistant. But Cryptosporidium is actually more susceptible to desiccation than the other parasites, in particular Cyclospora. So uh, we've been trying to find ways of killing it. Of course, the classical is the chemical inactivation. And yes, if you heat it up or you freeze it, you will kill it because it's a eukaryote. So the formation of crystals will damage the, the integrity of the organism and, will, and it will die. There's been other work being done or that was done using UV radiation, high pressure processing and gamma irradiation. Uh, using surrogates in area and toxoplasma. Uh, again, this was not uh, uh, tested in using cyclospora or cysts. Because we were also working uh, uh, with, uh, in the farm, we were trying to figure out, well, how about if we test the fungicides or insecticides that are used in the field? Do they have any effect on the, on the sporulation of cyclospora because again, we don't have an in vitro system, we don't have an in vivo system to test for viability. So again, we tested all of these uh, chemicals at different concentrations, these pesticides, and the only one that did something, some effect on the sporulation was um, manomil, which is a fungicide that is used uh, 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 by the growers. The other thing that was interesting is this. Um, as you may recall, um, the study was done by Lucy Robertson. She did it in the refrigerator and she did it on the countertops and uh, cupboard. We did something similar with, but with cyclospora. But in this case was more about detection of the parasite because again, um, viability is, uh, is a little more challenging than that. So we have two different conditions here. The very first one is if we keep it in a greenhouse at, um, at the perfect temperatures, nicely protected uh, uh, in cilantro as well as in basil. So we inoculated the cilantro and basil plants and we kept them for up to 23 days. And you can see here that we can detect cyclospora, a large number of detection from 100%. Here we can detect 80 to 60% of the contaminated products um, in under these protected conditions. But again, if we go and we mimic what goes on in Puebla, for example, because that's what we wanted to do. And uh, if we start with 100% detection of uh, this uh, cilantro and basil, you can tell that uh, the detection keeps going lower and lower and lower. And by day 15 and 23, there's very few samples that actually can be uh, we can identify cyclospora. So again, the message in this slide is depending on the conditions, this parasite can be present or not uh, 
or can, you can be detected or not in the environment. The next step is whether they are viable or not. And that's something we, that we are really, really working hard on trying to figure out. Because again, once you do a molecular testing, all you're detecting is DNA. You're not detecting where the organism or the, um, the OOCs is actually infectious or not. FDA uh, developed a method, the PAMC, that is, was used for detection of uh, cyclospora in agricultural water. They are using 10 liter water samples uh, with this whole fiber system and that uh, concentrate at the max uh, NT, the turbidity of uh, 40 NTUs. We also, and again, other groups, uh, we all have our methods and uh, um, uh, I guess uh, it's, it would be a matter of knowing which method is better, but at right now, this is the method that FDA uses. Again, um, uh, there's another group that is doing studies in Arizona and um, uh, they don't use this method. We also do water testing, but we don't use this, uh, these methods. Uh, we use larger volumes of water and DNTUs is not as critical for us as, uh, as for this method. And then uh, the molecular testing, uh, that was the concentration preparation of the sample. And this is the method for FDA, it's a qPCR, which is, amplify is amplifying on more than about a hundred base pairs. And there's this uh, diagram flow on when is it that the sample is called positive or negative. One of the challenges that we see in our experience, and we are right now testing a lot of samples, is that when we find a positive sample, you have to run several tests. And uh, not, we are not always, if you get a positive sample because of the low number of contaminants, um, you may not be able to get it again. So for us, it's critical. Uh, we, at, at least at this point, we're using conventional PCR because whatever product that comes positive, we can sequence. In this case, if you have a positive or acute PCR, uh, for, uh, you have to run using other methods in order to determine, uh, for one thing, for confirmation, and the second one to see if you can do some um, fingerprinting or some uh, further characterization. So, I think we all have different, perhaps the same objective, but different ways of, uh, of getting to the final goal. So again, the, we have several challenges. Availability of a parasite is one of them. Uh, again, it's exclusively anthropomorphic. We don't have an in vitro in vivo model. Um, having a simple and fast detection method, uh, especially if you could, we could do it in the field would be fantastic. Testing of cyclospora is very expensive. I mean, very expensive, even for the US standard. So if this testing is expected out of uh, people that are growing their products overseas, it's very prohibitive. The fingerprinting and genotyping tools that are available uh, are mostly for uh, uh, cyclospora that was uh, present in human fecal samples. But again, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, testing environmental samples, that gives you very few organisms and trying to do any of this uh, genotyping is, uh, is challenging, not because of the method, but because of the number of uh, organisms present. Prevention and control, critical prevention. Uh, control, we don't have the tools to control or put some kind of a a critical uh, point where we could actually attempt to kill the organism, like what we do with, uh, with bacteria. Sanitizers, uh, the industry is very interested in that, but again, we don't have anything yet. And of course, the one of the challenges that we have when it comes to the epidemiology is that uh, the outbreaks will, it, uh, Cyclospora takes uh, its time. It will take uh, seven days, 15 days, and then you had to remember what you ate 14 days prior to illness. And uh, that has proven to be very challenging. And I do this every year. I ask my students, you know, when we have a mini lab uh, session and the kids don't remember anything but what they ate 14 days prior. So I think that's one of the challenges that we have when 
when there's an outbreak investigation, that's perhaps one of the reasons also why when you're trying to uh, do food attributions, it's almost impossible. But again, that doesn't mean that there is not a method. Uh, the national hypothesis generated question, uh, which uh, the public health labs uh, do, helps a lot. And then each, uh, each state pretty much has their own specific questions for Cyclospora to narrow down with which products were contaminated or were implicated in this. And of course, the public health labs are uh, playing a critical role, especially now that uh, we have a culturally independent methods which is probably responsible for now catching more cases of cyclospora every year that don't require any conventional parasitological testing. It's just a, a very fast one method. So uh, like uh, FDA, like uh, other uh, agencies and, uh, and public health labs, we're trying to connect the dots. What's going on in the farms? What are the practices that are being done? How can we actually educate? How can we train the people from the processors to the harvesters to the people that do maintenance in the facilities to learn about cyclospora and uh, um, avoid those risky behaviors that might be responsible for an outbreak? And finally, at the household to make sure that these foods are, are safe. So that's all I have. I don't know if you have any questions for me. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ortega. And thank you for sharing such valuable information with us. It seems, you know, we really still have a lot to learn about this parasite. So we're certainly looking forward to learning more and seeing what research comes down. We would like to take this time to open up the floor for some questions. Um, let me see here. We do have a couple of questions on the board. The first one has to do with transition between humans. Sorry. <laughs> um, so the question is, is the very young and very old infections due to hand to mouth contact? I don't think so. And the reason for that is uh, uh, if you see, for example, cryptosporidium is the best example. Uh, when the cryptosporidium is excreted, it's already infectious. So if uh, this, and perhaps if you work in the health department, you know the requirements is that uh, changing diapers has to be with gloves and all of that. That is to prevent transmission person to person. In the case of uh, cyclospora, the all cysts, once excreted, they are not infectious yet. They're not differentiated. So they could not infect. They will have to stay somewhere in the environment. Uh, before it actually can become infectious. So, so and again, the other question is, um, uh, there may not necessarily need to be a, um, a reservoir, but it's just uh, the oasis have to be somewhere in the right in the right environment to differentiate and become infectious. Thank you. Our next question is. Do your surface water sugge studies suggest any specific control mechanisms or measures for irrigation water? Well, this is something interesting. And uh, again, now I've been working with um, a lot of the food industry for, for a few years. And it's a lot of water, for one thing. And the sources of water are many. And uh, uh, some uh, farmers, what they do is they do filtration, sand filtration and all of that. And we actually did a very small study a few years ago testing for that, uh, for that sand, for those sand filters. And yeah, we found all kinds of things, but we didn't find cyclospora, which was kind of uh, interesting. Uh, but again, um, the problem with surface water is protecting it, avoiding that uh, humans use that water. Uh, for recreational purposes, for example. That could be one easy way to get uh, uh, that water contaminated or runoffs. That would be the other one. Uh, again, uh, the contamination can happen. It's human contamination. So of course you don't want that sewage going into your, your, 
irrigation uh, uh, lines or canals or whatever it is that you're using. Um, there is some groups uh, that are trying, they're testing UV radiation of the water before it goes to the, uh, to the farms. That's something that we still need to work on. But, but what's interesting about Cyclospora is one of the properties of the oasis wall is that um, it's, it's out of, uh, when the oasis, oasis is exposed to the UV light, the UV light will reflect, which means that the UV light uh, will not go, or at least not all of it will go uh, to the sporozoite and kill the parasite. It's gonna, it's the UV light is being reflected. So uh, that's another possibility, the UV radiation. But again, that's something that it's still being worked and there's no evidence yet that it works. Okay, and, and while we're talking about UV, the next question I believe has to do with one of the studies that you were conducting. The question is, do you think humidity and UV light are synergistic or did you test their effect independently? Um, these were settings that were together. So uh, UV is a little more complicated than, than what I thought. If we were looking with uh, sunlight and the different types of UV and uh, uh, um, Bacteria or the microbial effect of the UV light, it's it's a little more complicated. So that's something that still we don't know. What we know is that uh, at least in the regions that uh, where Cyclospora is endemic, uh, the and again we haven't test we haven't separated the UV light from the from the light intensity itself or you know the different types of UV light. So that those are questions that still are. Uh, to be determined. Yeah. Okay. And as a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, you can submit the question into the Q&A box and we'll be sure to pose it to Dr. Ortega. The next question we have for you today is, what can retail food establishments do to prevent cyclospora outbreaks if the product is already received contaminated? Depends on the product. Uh, if it's something that, uh, it, as I mentioned to you, freezing and cooking is or high temperatures is going to kill the organism. But again, uh, the pros that are implicated are not the kind of product that you can actually do that, like lettuce and cabbage. Those are things that you normally uh, use it as raw product. So there isn't very much that you can do. You can wash it, but again, there's no guarantee that you have removed everything. More than that, if you look at the packaged uh, salad uh, um, greens, those products have already been triple washed in the processing facility and they're still causing illness. So that's giving you an idea on the adherence that is probably much stronger than what we think. That, uh, and not only that, but those is much lower than what we think. In the case of uh, uh, cryptosporidium, for example, uh, uh, it's considered to be hundred depending on people say it's one oasis, or people say it's a hundred oasis. So again, even washing is perhaps it's more likely not the best solution to make. That's why it's so important that, and you know that that's the industry recognizes that that we really need some kind of uh, disinfection method to uh, perhaps not have a 100% guarantee that a product is safe, but at least uh, reduce the chances of infection. So you're saying really the, the control at the source coupled with an effective sanitizing method that would remove the oasis from the product would be ideal prior to reaching retail? <laughs> that would be good, but again, uh, if... Uh, um, Again, working with the processing facilities, you basically, your most common uh, rinses are chlorine-based or uh, peroxacetic acid-based products. Yeah, that's it. So we really have to find some uh, better alternative that is not toxic, uh, but again, that can be effective against this virus. And again, uh, 
Psychospora has been notorious because of the severe the illness in you know, how you can detect it. But let's not forget about also blood. Not Having a, much a little about bit of connection issues. Sorry, Dr. Ortega, to interrupt you. Uh-huh. Okay. Sorry, we we're just cutting so, out just a little bit. Could you repeat that? Okay, yes. Uh, toxoplasma, for example. This is another coccidian parasite. It is zoonotic. So other animals, and basically any feline can uh, get infected and can be spread everywhere. So, uh, and it's very resistant, this parasite, and it gets very, very, uh, a very bad parasite for humans. So. I wonder if uh, we ever look at this parasite in prose, if we can find it. And um, I would be willing to bet that we can find this parasite in fresh prose. So uh, again, uh, the idea of using a disinfectant is a great uh, uh, alternative, but we need to find something that is very effective against it. And so far we don't have it. Understood. Another question is, what is the prevalence of cyclospora in developing countries like the Caribbean? Okay, well, it depends. Because if you study it, you will find it. But if you don't study it, we don't have any data, okay? So, for example, um, Haiti, you can find it in, you can find it in Cuba. You can find it, let's see, uh, in that, in that area, that location, um, Puerto Rico, you can find it in Dominican Republic. So you basically can find uh, it in, in as, as well as countries that are in the area. But again, it depends on, on, on if people are looking for it. If uh, people are not looking for it, of, of course. Uh, we will not have any data. That doesn't mean that it's not present, it's just that we're not looking for it. Certainly. Okay, and it looks like we have time for just a, a couple more. There is a comment that came in. Um, thank you, Dr. Ortega, for a great presentation. Um, here in New York, we started screening retail products this summer for cyclospora using the FDA PCR method. Do you have any comments on that? No, that's great. That's great. We really need to know uh, what's going on. And if you're using that uh, um, that process, I wish you the best and uh, let us know how it goes. I know that uh, New York keeps also getting um, hit with cyclospora almost every year. Actually, the very first work was uh, with cyclospora was uh, from Cornell Rosemary Suave. She was a physician and infectious disease specialist. And she's actually the one that uh, um, I've had a, a very first report of uh, cyclospora in uh, actually in AIDS patients that were coming from vacationing and uh, uh, it was actually two cases. So uh, I know that New York has a very good state lab and uh, I wish you the best and, uh, and um, if I would suggest to you, if I can be of any help, here I am. My recommendation would be the protocol that FDA has. They test 20, 25 grams of vegetables and um, 50 grams of berries. Uh, I would suggest that uh, if you can increase the volume, that would be fantastic. And if you want to stay with the FDA method, uh, do more composites. That would be great because that will give you better chances of detecting something. 25 grams is almost, it's very, very little. So go for more. If you can, you know, because all of this uh, requires a budget and uh, <laughs> there's always that limitation. Of course. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Ortega. We are nearing the end of our time today. Um, I do hope that you'll join us next Tuesday as we hear from Dr. Chip Manuel and Dr. Matthew Moore as we learn about norovirus. But today, I did want to sincerely thank uh, you, Dr. Ortega, for your time and valuable insights on the webinar. Uh, we'd like to thank all of the attendees for their time and participation, especially during these times. Um, thank you for joining us in our third celebration webinar of Food Safety Education Month, and we hope you stay well, and, and thank you very much.